Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. And I have a great show today. You know, you watch the show and we always talk about case studies and we always talk about doing the best you can for your clients. And something came across our desk, a website, a company that just really caught our attention. We were sitting around talking about it. And when you go to their website, you go to their offering, they have some tremendous case studies about what they've been able to do in the media and agency space. And the people they work for, the people they do the work for, they love doing business with Twin Creek Media. I mean, it's a remarkable company. Of course, the creative director and partner's name is Mr. James Shaw. We've been able to invite him on the show today to not only discuss what they do at Twin Creek, but also talk about this passion that they have to make sure that their clients have an incredible outcome that leads to these amazing case studies. So James, welcome to the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. I mean, you're up in British Columbia, as everybody knows, and you have a great following. A number of customers and clients have been with you for many, many years. But before we get started, because you sort of have a secret sauce, I'm going to try and get into that a little bit. Uh, why don't we pull the lens back to 30,000 feet and tell us about Twin Creek, and then we'll get started. Yeah, for sure. So Twin Creek Media was uh, formed by accident, actually. So uh, I was in college with my buddy. Um, we were, you know, figuring out what to do when we graduated. Uh, digital media, it was a design program. Um, he went and got a job for $10 an hour. You know, this was this is way back in the early 2000s. Uh, and I couldn't afford to live for $10 an hour. I was already married. You know, we had a baby <laughs> mortgage. I'm like, what is going on here? So um, I, you know, against my will in every way possible, had to start my own company um, just so I could make a bit more in 10 bucks an hour. I mean, that was really the gist of it. Um, it was survive, you know, survival. I mean, that was the only rule. So uh, yeah, you know, I formed a little company in my attic, in my house, um, went out there, met people, um, you know, had to really become social uh, and, and, and rub shoulders and, and learn how to network properly. And bit by bit, you know, you pick up little jobs here and there, photography, video, design, uh, websites, social media stuff, which was just getting going back then. Um, Facebook was kind of brand new, you know, um, and uh, bit by bit, you know, I was the, the go-to guy in our town. Um, you know, for little projects here and there. And it kind of grew from there, you know, fast forward a few years, we got our first office, um, uh, hired our first employee, you know, my, my buddy from college actually joined our company as a partner. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a great, great roller coaster ride. Um, at the time it wasn't so great. Actually, the roller coaster was like one of those, uh, you know, half the time you're, you're think you're gonna, you know, uh, die at any point. Um, but, uh, we hung in there for a few years, stabilized a little bit, uh, you know, five years in 10 years in, it got way more stable, more employees, more, better reputation, you know, things evened out. And, uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. Um, we became a full service agency, um, where we, we started as a web firm, web development company, actually, and then be bridged into that full service marketing company. And it's been a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great entrepreneurial journey. You started your business because you wanted to get out of a $10 an hour job. And now you're working a hundred hours for yourself, you know, instead of 40 hours for somebody else. I love it so much. Let's talk about it because, you know, when we look at your company, one thing that really sort of stood out when we sort of did the deep dive is you look at yourself sort of as the perfect extension of a company's in-house marketing management sort of system, marketing management group. And when we think about it, partnerships take a lot of trust and you've been able to gain this great trust from your clients. What type of clients or potential clients reach out to you? They say, hey, James, we've heard about what you're doing. We want in, we want to use your expertise. Are you working with small to mid-sized companies, larger companies, who's your perfect client right now? Yeah. I mean, technically, when you look at the stats, um, small to mid-sized companies, uh, but we kind of classify that by um, how many more embodies do they have you know, in their operation? <laughs> um, do they have five people? Okay. That's probably the smallest company we're going to work with. Um, do they have about uh, 200 people? That's probably the largest company we're going to work with. So, you know, revenue wise, it's it's around a million dollars to $20 million a year. 
Um, so it's, it's when a company has some in-house talent, they have some in-house resources. They just don't have everybody, right? So they haven't built out their full marketing department and that's where our team literally just plugs in. So, um, that's our, that's our value proposition. You know, we're an extension of your marketing team where your extended marketing department, you know, we just don't happen to be in your building, but we're across the road or across town or across the country, you know, um, virtual these days, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I love it, James. And of course, we had a pre-interview like I do with all of my clients, the people that come on the show. And of course, one thing that caught my attention, you have a secret sauce. I mean, I love it so much. So one thing that you do that's very unique is that you look at spaces. In other words, you're not going to take on a client and then the next day take on their competition. And I love that so much. Let's talk about where that came from and how that has served you and your team so well. Yeah, that's that's actually a really big differentiator between us and other marketing companies. Um, so, you know, one of our principles is to only work with one company in the industry in the area. So, you know, one for one for one. So, which means, you know, we can work with another, you know, manufacturing company in that space or, or another education company or, you know, um, a realtor, like a, like a property developer or something like that as long as they're not a direct competitor, you know? So, but if they are, then no, we're playing on their team. So we make the metaphor of a hockey game, you know? So really how can you put on, you know, a company's Jersey and wear their logo on your chest and play as hard as you can for them to help them win. And then suddenly at halftime, you know, you switch teams and you put on the other guy's Jersey and the other team, and then you're playing for them. And you're like, well, who's going to win here? How, who are you helping to win? And it became a conflict of interest for us. Um, and we decided to, you know, to really partner long-term and go very deep and be very loyal to the companies we're working with. And they return that favor though. They, they're, they, they understand that we're not just kind of, uh, an outsider, and then we're going to go and help somebody right away and, and, and kind of all be at conflict. So they, they return that loyalty and we end up working with companies for years and years and years and years, you know, on a monthly basis on that kind of, you know, no contracts. We don't make people sign, you know, their first child away or their kidney. You know, it's very open and it's very transparent. Um, and it's, it's all about results in the end, but because we're only playing for one team, bam, we're so focused on helping them win, right? I love it. Like you said, bam. And of course, you know, you have four things that really set you apart. Number one, you look at your partners as team members. I mean, you really have this team commitment to doing the right thing and doing it all the time, even when no one's looking. Of course, you know, you say that, you know, our friends are your friends. You, of course, have no long-term contracts. And Another thing that's very interesting, you have no commission on media buy. So people really love your offering. You know, let's talk about it because the corporate culture sort of starts at the top. And of course, you know, you and your team, you're very tight. And of course, you work as a team. So what's it like leading the corporate culture? You know, here you were, you started from a $10 an hour job, you sort of moved into it. Now you've got a full service agency. When you go to work in the morning, James, what's it like thinking that, you know, everybody on your team is going to take the cue from the way in which you walk, the way you talk, the way you present yourself? Do you enjoy that sort of pressure, if you will, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's hard to... Um really change who you are as a person. So you end up gathering people that can stand to be around you, <laughs> you know? Um, and when you're hiring people, you know, you always want to make sure that uh, you're hiring someone who's better than you at something. You know, it's one of my core beliefs um, to build a strong team. Uh, but also they have to just get along with you as a person. They have to get along with your corporate, corporate culture, as you said. So transparency, openness, you know, if I move the camera around just a little bit here, you know, most of the team's all remote today on Fridays, but, uh, you know, it's um, looking up and down the hallways. There's usually nine people, 10 people in here, and um, we're, we're in a big open group, right? So that's, that's kind of one of the neat things about that. There's no walls. Um, I mean, you can hide your way, hide yourself in the Zoom room or the couch room where we have meetings and sh shut the door, but it's a big open room. So being a person that doesn't need to secret, you know, you know, cover your stuff up and, and, and it's all in front of your screen. Someone walks by, they see what you're doing. So they hear your phone calls half the time when clients call in, you know, um, it's, uh, it's very open that way. So that's one thing. And not everyone can handle that, man. We have people in here that, 
lasted a couple of weeks and they f- absolutely freak out because they can't shut the door. They can't be alone. Um, so we use headphones too. It's like headphones on walls up, you know, that's a, that's a symbol for people. Um, and, and just that owning your mistakes. Uh, so you have to be a person that can risk a little bit, but then when you mess up, you quickly own that, um, re- that responsibility and that mistake, uh, people that try to hide their mistakes and bury them again, they don't last, uh, just, they can't handle the, the pressure and the transparency of, of things. Um, one other thing would be a competitive spirit or some sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, when we we bring people in, they're almost right away at management level because our team is is nine people, uh, fairly senior, you know, paid pay, paid pretty good too. So there we don't have a lot of junior staff. We have contractors for things like that. We have about nine ten contractors as well, but uh, the team itself internally is quite senior. Um, so a lot of responsibility. They have to be self driven. You know, have, light a fire under them you know, uh, not sit there and be told what to do every day, you know, that's not gonna, not gonna fly either. So yeah, culture is super important and you need that team that plays well together. Yeah. It's a great piece of advice for the entrepreneurs watching the show. Of course you have your core team and then you have your extended team of industry pros, which really instantly amplifies your client's in-house capabilities. I'll call it. And really for the past 17, 18, 19 years, you've worked with hundreds of really great Canadian companies to really leverage your experience, to really get incredible ROI, sometimes up to 10X. It's really remarkable. Let's talk about that. How important is the ROI? Is that really the thing that you're focusing on for your clients? Where's the focus? Our focus is on their goals. It's not always ROI. Um, So for example, uh, academic, um, you know, companies like schools, we work for private schools, universities, enrollment campaigns, you know, they're not actually counting the dollars, they're counting enrollment or signups. Um, we work with charities, you know, what are they, what are they counting? I mean, fundraising, yes, then it's dollars, but if it's attendance to events or if it's, uh, you know, publicity or getting, you know, in the local media and getting their, their cause known, you know, a lot more awareness, that's a different goal than money as well. Um, you know, for regular businesses, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, you know, ROI is always one of the pieces. Um, but sometimes we're actually running recruitment campaigns for those companies too, because they're short staffed. So we're doing different things. So different goals for different companies. ROI is super critical. Lots of agencies do not get into that side of it. They will stop at the level of, well, here's your funnel. We got lots of people seeing you. We got lots of clicks on your ads. They go to their website and yeah. You take it from there, you know, have a good time. And so they don't really measure it all the way through to what's the end result. And the end result should be a sale or a sign up or something that, that actually is measurable. So otherwise, you don't know if your full campaign is working properly if you're not measuring the whole funnel. So that's, that's kind of where we're different. We're very math, nerdy, analytical, you know, techie, lots of spreadsheets, lots of analysis software. And because we're working for that company trying to help them win, We have to know if we're winning. (laughs) If we're not winning, we got to change something and do something different so they can win, right? So it's, uh, we're, yeah, very analytical. Yeah, I love it. You love the data. You love getting into the data. Your entire team at Twin Creek loves data. Your your data gates, but you're in the marketing realm. Let's talk about a little bit. So you mentioned the funnel. That's an interesting sort of thing to talk about because a lot of companies start with the funnel and maybe they're getting some clientele, or maybe they're getting some leads. But we see sometimes that at the end of the funnel, where they actually get the lead, that some companies are too slow getting back to the leads, or they don't pay attention to the leads, or maybe they don't sort of put the white kit gloves on to work with those leads that end up at the end of the funnel. Do you ever see that? And how do you fix that for the clients that you see that with? Yeah, that's a, we do see that. Um, there's two things that could be going on. A, they're they're literally just uh, falling down and not doing their job. So marketing and sales work together, right? So marketing is going to lead the horse to water. You know, the sales guy is going to help the horse drink and actually get it get it happening. So we're just kind of two parts there. So if we've done our role of getting the funnel full and they're not following up, they're not doing their thing. You know, that's just on them. And we tell them that it's like, guys, you know, what's happening? Or they're just overwhelmed. Um, there's been uh, quite a few times, really, where it's like, here, drink from the fire hose. 
<laughs> you know, it's not their fault that they're not drinking, that they're not actually fulfilling those, uh, you know, getting those leads and doing something with them. They're just getting way too many. So we'll turn down the volume on Google search ads or, or social media campaigns or, you know, hold off on that press release or, you know, you know, not launch so many pieces that they're getting so many inquiries happening. So that's a, that, that's, and that's on us to know if we're, you know, um, trying to hold the fire hose, <laughs> you know, and blast them away. So, yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's great. And of course you can, uh, you know, ratchet it up or ratchet it down depending on the data that you see and what's happening with the outcomes for your clients. You know, it's very interesting, James. We interview very interesting people, of course, many high profile people, people that are, you know, running incredible companies, of course. And one thing that we see quite often are whiteboards behind them. And people love the whiteboard things out. And in your particular whiteboard, you have sticky notes of different colors on the whiteboard. I'm sure the entrepreneurs watching the show are seeing that. And I'm saying to myself, well, that's a great way just to visually organize besides using data and the computer and technology to also let your team visualize what's happening at a moment's notice on the board. Is that sort of the idea behind what you're doing there? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, we're very software driven um, and, but nothing replaces physical stuff. That's why we still have an office. That's why we still work as a team three days a week and we're remote two days a week, you know, uh, because physical, you can't just be a virtual person and, you know, the whole meta universe and whatever, I don't know what's going to happen with that ready player one and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I like, uh, you know, we like being, being together, working as a team. So the, the whiteboard here, yeah, the projects move from one end of the whiteboard to the other as they work through their flow. Um, that stuff's also in software as well. It's everyone's got their own way of looking at that, but it's nice to, to have a stand-up meeting. You know, we, we do on Tuesday mornings as a group, we get together and say, who's doing what for the week? You know, what does your week look like? So we have a quick stand-up meeting around this table here. I'm in the kind of the coffee area behind me. You can, but, um, and, and we just, and we use the whiteboard too. And we used to move stickies around and it's like, Hey, projects are moving. Great. What, and these ones are stalled out and then we kind of brainstorm why, you know, what, how can we get the, these ones back on track? So the whiteboard is really good because the sticky notes, you can move, bam, 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 you know, it's visual. Um, and it's also putting a new sticky board, new sticky on there is like, Hey, celebrate a win or, or fin one crosses the finish line. You're like, yeah, this one's done. Right. So it's nice. That's nice. Yeah. I love it. Of course, we started the show, of course, that whiteboard and the sticky notes leads to client satisfaction. And one thing that we started the show with were your case studies. And what we found very interesting is, you know, you're very transparent. You put the case studies up on your website. You want everybody to read them. I mean, you have some great case studies from Space Center Storage and Planet B and Fresh Air, the companies that you work with. And we're very curious about that because it seems like you almost have made that a highlight of you're offering, you, want, you say to people, hey, we're transparent. Look at what we've done. Look at our case studies. Look at the clients we've helped. How important has that been to the trajectory of your business to share these great case studies so people can see sort of not only what the outcome has been, but how you process the information and take things from point A to Z? Yeah, it really de demonstrates how we work as a partner from the top of the funnel to the all the way through. And we're really dedicated to helping them win. Now, about 10 years ago, something dawned on me. And it was at the time in marketing in the digital world, there was um, this kind of overwhelming push to specialize in something. Uh, you know, you need to be an absolute expert in Google search ads, pay-per-click right? Or you needed to really own copywriting and just be that master copywriter. Or if you're focused on video, you make, you know, awesome marketing videos and promotion videos. So, and, and, and literally everybody in the space was doing it. So um, this is going back to the case studies of why they work is because we suddenly thought, well, if everyone's specializing, who is generalizing? Nobody, nobody is being a generalist for a certain size company. And again, we identified our, our market is going to be a company of this size with this many people with th these needs. And they needed a marketing department. They needed this person, that person, the other guy, this person and, and her. And, you know, so we gathered this up and we realized that, okay, we are 
the one size fits all, not all sizes, but one size fits all. <laughs> That's contradictory. One size fits all for mid-sized companies. There you go. A mid-size fits all. Um, and it was perfect. So we plug our department in, we get stuff done. We do all the pieces that is missing because they have the real marketing people. They have a director in there. They have you know somebody doing something, but they don't have extra nine people that they really need to see huge results. So this is what we do. We get the results because we're doing all the pieces with the graphic design and the web and the marketing and the PR and the Google search and the social media and the video, like all the pieces, we can measure now what's working and do the whole story. And because we, we know what, what we started with and what the results were, we have case studies. And these case studies are how we learn, how we communicate our value to other companies. And in the end of the day, people have a distrust of marketing people. In, in a sense, or, or of advertising guys, you know, they're trying to sell them something. So they get a lot of phone call, people getting spam, you know, oh, I can get you number one on Google right now today, 24 hours, you know. Um, so, you know, you get those phone calls all the time, business owners do. Uh, and so we needed to something that was not us just yabbering on about how awesome we are without any proof. Case studies are our proof. They also are very relatable to other companies. And yeah, and then people say, yeah, can you help me? I, this is this really made sense to me. I need something like that. And then they, you know, they give us a call and we go from there. I love it. Of course, you have incredible testimonials. I mean, video testimonials. Let's touch on that briefly. I know you've only cut out a certain amount of time. For the entrepreneurs watching the show, how important are testimonials to their evolution of their company, to the growth of their company? They're gold. Like testimonials are gold. There's, a, there's actually a hierarchy of testimonials. Um, video testimonials are the most powerful because they're the hardest to fake. Then a written testimonial with a photo, when, you know, when the person's name identify the company they work for, that's, that's pretty good too. Again, a, harder to fake. And then the, the generic testimonial with kind of like initials, you know, John P or something. Well, from which company? I don't know. He didn't identify it. Oh, really good job. Love this company. Like you have no idea if that's a real testimonial or not. So there's a hierarchy of testimonials, but they're all worth gold. And as soon as you can get one, if you're a startup company, a new entrepreneur, as soon as you can get testimonials, start asking for them from the very first client, right? Yeah. Great advice, of course. And before I let you go, there's something that really stood out about what you're doing. You love to give back. I mean, you have an idea in your mind at Twin Creek Media that you want to support organizations and programs. And it's part of your DNA. You also allow your employees to donate as well. Where did that passion to give back come from, you know, with regard to the way you see the world and, and helping others in a meaningful way? Just it's that it's that childhood dream of uh, leaving your mark on the world, I guess, leaving the world a better place than you found it. Um, something like that. We have a we have our our company principles and our core values, which are kind of kind of strange actually. So one's capitalism, <laughs> the other one's philanthropy, which are at, at odds often. Like keep the most money, no, give the most money away possible. So there, I love how those two things battle. And the other the other point at the top of the triangle here we is is integrity. So integrity above all. So that's integrity is what is going to, you know, make sure that the capitalism and the, in the philanthropy side of thing, get along with each other, like two brothers that are always fighting. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's from the heart, I guess it's, and it's also from the head, but I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's how we run things. <laughs> yeah. I love it. You call them the oddball core values, which is great. We're going to bring you back on the show. I want to talk about values a little bit more. I think this could be a very interesting next segment for us to have for our people that watch the show. But before I let you go, let's get back to the entrepreneurs watching the show, because sometimes the younger ones, maybe they're having a tough time Maybe they're having a pothole in the road they can't get through, you know, hitting a wall that they freeze in the frame. Maybe you can share, James, some insight on what it takes as an entrepreneur, this gentleman that started at 10 bucks an hour and moved his way up about what it takes to keep on pushing when the going gets tough. Yeah, I, I, there's three little things I think that's that was critical to my own success. Um, so A is your the people around you. Uh, I was not a, an island, you know, when I, I had um, family, I had friends, um, my wife was a huge, huge support. Um, so 
it's a very, very high pressure time when you're starting a company. Um, and you have extreme highs, and extreme lows. So, you know, instability like all day long. So it's, uh, you need that support network of some type. So you gather some people around you that, that you're, that are going to lift you out of those low places. Um, the second thing would be uh, the ability to pivot. So, and this is almost the opposite of the third value, which is grit, right? So you need this absolutely single mind of focus. You are going to succeed no matter what. Um, because I had other people relying on me, you know, uh, we had a mortgage and a, and a new baby. There was a lot of motivation there. I didn't have to kind of pull myself out of bed and like, oh, you know, I was just like, I got to get going. I got to go. I got to go. Um, so there's that, that grit is really, really important. But grit, if you think about uh, stubbornness, which it is a little bit, but if you don't, if you just ignore the signs because you're head down, you're stubborn, you're driving forward and you're not willing to change your mind, you're not willing to hear the opinion of others, you're not willing to read the road signs that you're about to drive off a cliff, you know, that's not smart. Yeah, you have grit, but you're going to die. <laughs> it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So the ability to, um, to be single-minded, but then open, open to new things and be I was like, yes, okay, I'm going to follow that opportunity. I'm going to pivot. And you have to be, you have to adapt quickly as an entrepreneur. Otherwise you will get eaten alive. Yeah. Wow. I love it. And for the entrepreneurs watching the show, rewind what James just said. James believes that the truth is found in the middle of their competing values, the integrity, philanthropy, and capitalism. And it's right in the middle that becomes the core. It's great. We'll have you back on the show. I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series today. This has been a fascinating look at your business and what really changes the world in terms of what a business can do, not only in their communities, but more importantly for their clients as well. So thanks so much for coming on the show today, James. It's been remarkable. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Andy. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. 